164. Nothing but the blood. If you'd stand with me. Let's sing the first and last verse. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain, no. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain, no. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a day that we can come. But Lord, we thank you for your blood that was the only thing that could give us salvation and give us forgiveness for our sins. So we thank you for that, Lord. Now, Lord, I pray that you would um, be with our church this morning and our classes. And Lord, uh, many people sick this morning. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, be with them and Bring them back to us real soon. Lord, um, we pray for our missionaries that you would bless them wherever they're at and all over the world and here at home. Lord, I pray that you would bless the offering that we're about to take for them. We'll ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. So normally we have two classes, but because we're so down this morning... Yeah, we thought we'd combine the classes upstairs, and so as they're getting the offering, I'm going to try to do this as quickly as possible and give it right over to Brother Zelmer. There are hardly any kids here today, and most of them are summers. In fact, all of them may be summers. I'm looking. They are all... This is going to be... It's going to be interesting. So we're going to have a trivia game like we normally do, all right? And Joe and Julia will be the um, team captains. And um, actually, let's just do it this way. Let's do Summer's Boys versus Summer's Girls. Do it that way. All right, come up here real quick, real quick, all, the, all, all of my kids, including Levi. Quick, quick, quick. When I say kids, I mean little kids. That's what I mean. Julia, I'm going to give you an opportunity, and Joe, I'm going to give you an opportunity. You can substitute one of your teammates for, there's, there's Leonard's. And I see Miss Natalie Sprott. I see Miss Hannah Kratzer. Um, there's JJ. Do you want to substitute one of your teammates? I mean, Julia got rid of Harmony just like that. I barely even finished the statement. Harmony's out. Who's in? Yeah. Hannah is in. All right, Mark, do you want to substitute anybody? You don't have Isaac. He's greeting downstairs. All right, so pick somebody to take his place. Doesn't have to be a boy. Quick, quick, quick. Quick, quick. JJ, it is. Don't know how smart that was, but okay. All right. So the categories are Galatians 6 and villains of the Bible. All right. So we got to go really quick because we have three rounds we have to get through, and I don't want to take too much of Brother Zomer's time. Um, so, Glenn, why don't we um, actually, never mind. Just everybody, you guys can see the board up here. You don't have to see the backboard. All right, so here we go. Team one will be the girls. Girls, you get to pick your square first. Where are you going? Number three. Which king saw the handwriting on the wall? I'm giving you five seconds. Which king saw the handwriting on the wall? Ashley, where is that? Is incorrect. Belshazzar is the correct answer. <laughs> the, the, the fighting and the bickering is like. Normal day at the Summer's house over here. All right, boys, where are you going? Boys, you are exes, just so you know. You got that mark instead of them. Going number five. What makes someone an antichrist? According to Galatians 6, what makes somebody an antichrist? Five seconds. 
<laughs> not being Christ-like. Denying that Jesus was coming in the flesh. That is the wrong answer. All right, girls, where are you going? Number two. How long after his dream was Nebuchadnezzar driven to the fields to live like a beast? <laughs> Hannah said she wants to answer this one. <laughs> 12 months is the right answer. Seven years is the wrong answer. Wow, boys, for the win, <laughs> number one. No one's gotten one right yet, and this is for the win. This is ridiculous. Who was king when Jesus was born, and what did he do to try to make sure Jesus was dead? Very good. Congratulations. You won the first round. That was really, really pathetic. I don't think you even deserve. No, do not applause that. <laughs> applause that. Applaud that. All right, here we go. Round number two. Boys took it to the last one, so you guys get to pick. Go quick. Number five. According to Galatians 6.14, who is Paul crucified unto? This is for the boys. <laughs> the world would be the correct answer. <laughs> This is embarrassing. All right, girls, I like your strategy there. That was, that was nice. All right, what, where are you going? Pick a square, Julia. What? Number one. According to Galatians 6, 18, what did Paul pronounce upon the Galatians? It has been like nine months since we've done Galatians 6 trivia, just so you know. Five seconds. The correct answer is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Congratulations on getting the first correct answer. All right, boys, where are you going? Number nine. According to Galatians 6, 11, how was this letter written? <laughs> With pencil and paper. The right, hand of fellowship. the right hand of fellowship. That is incorrect, but that was a good guess. With mine own hand is what Paul wrote. All right, so the girls took that round. Congratulations. We got a tiebreaker coming right now. Here we go. It wasn't obvious. Is that what you said? Okay, whatever. All right, round three. Girls, where are you going? Number one. According to Galatians 6.10, who should we do especially good unto? That is correct. And to them which are of the household of faith. Congratulations. Boys, where are you going? Number five. JJ, thanks for contributing. That was, that was amazing how you just did that. According to Galatians 6, 7, what will a man reap? Very good. All right. JJ. Girls, we're on a roll. That's two correct answers in a row. Number seven, according to Galatians 6, 5, what shall every man bear? His own burden is correct. Boys, where are you going? Number four. According to Galatians 6, 8, what will he that soweth to his flesh reap? That which is also of the flesh, we will give. Oh, no, we won't give that to you. I'm sorry. Wrong answer. Girls, Congratulations. You won how, I don't know. I think we had four correct answers the entire round. We have $5 McDonald's gift cards or $5 Amazon cards. McDonald's, obviously. All right. And Hannah? Oh, my word. I gave an answer. You did, you did give an answer. What do you want? Amazon it is. Brother Greg, it's all yours. Thanks. All right, well, good morning, everyone. I think I try to give everybody uh, just what the lesson was for today, but you may not, if you didn't receive it, I only have actually one in the back there, so. But we've been going through uh, defending the faith. We've started out in Genesis chapter number one and have been going through uh, the uh, Genesis. Right now we're on Genesis number six, chapter number six. You can open up your Bibles there. I do have most of the verses up on the screen, but what we've gone through just kind of Generally, where we've been, as I mentioned, right now we're in Genesis chapter 6, so we've been 
using six as kind of an entry into the flood and, and, and Noah and the ark, and, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the details in chapter number seven. But basically looking at chapter number six, if you kind of break it down, starting at a verse 11 there, we started out looking at God provided directions concerning the ark in the, in the scripture itself, and that's found in um, basically 6, 11 through number, verse 22. First part of that, the judgment of sinful man race had fully come. All mankind perished except for Noah and his family. All animal life and birds it was a global in extent except for the, uh, those bought in the ark. All earth would be covered by the flood. It was a global event. We also then went to the specifications of the ark. That was found in Genesis 6, 14 through 16. God designed it and provided instructions on how to build it, and we went to kind of all the details about the size of the ark and how, how it uh, survived the flood and, and uh, those types of things. And then uh, the means of judgment is kind of where we're at, right, where we left off last time. The means of judgment, the reason was the wickedness of the people and the global, not luck, local flood. And uh, I'm just going to read through this, just kind of remind, it seems like, when was the last time we were here? It's like, it's been like, it seems like eight weeks or something like that. No, it's, it's been a while. So I just want to read through. You can follow along either up, uh, up on the board or grab your Bibles. We're in Genesis chapter number seven. We're just going to read through this. It's kind of a, bring us back into memory of where we were when we last left off, which was about four weeks ago as I was on vacation and we had the two weeks off. Genesis chapter seven, starting at verse one. And the Lord said unto Noah, come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth." Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of every clean beast, of the beasts that are not clean, and of the fowls and everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God has commanded Noah." And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the, of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Jepheth and the sons of, Ham, of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark." They and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, and every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah and into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. They that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in." And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and, the, and it was lifted up upon the earth, above the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits, that's about a little over twenty-two feet, depending on your length of your cubit. Fifteen cubits upward, the waters prevailed, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils were the breath of life, and all that was in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed from upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heavens. And they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark." And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. Chapter 8, verse 1. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. 
And the waters returned from off the earth continually. After the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the windows of the ark, which he had made, and sent forth a raven, which went to and forth went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. She returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet another seven days and again sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came in unto him. In the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet another seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass in the six hundredth and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month was the earth dried. And God spoke, spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons, and thy son's wife with thee. So we, we've already kind of gone through a lot of the detail on the, the background, the number of days, and we kind of broke all that down. But basically, just as a summary, as you're looking through chapter 7 and chapter 8, and we're talking about the means of judgment here. Why did God judge mankind? God judged mankind because of the wickedness. If you recall, there was at least 120 days from the time that Noah had told, or I'm sorry, that God told Noah, Noah didn't tell God, but God told Noah that in 120 days I'm going to bring a flood upon the earth. And so during that time, we, are, we understand that, that Noah was probably most likely preaching the righteousness of God at that time, trying to get people to turn, but they were refused to turn. And uh, so, and basically, if you really look at it, from the time of, of uh, when Adam and Eve left the garden, it was at least 15, almost 1,600 years after that, that time frame. So it was all this time frame that the people had a chance to turn back to God, but they never did. You know, some people say, man, God's awful mean to just destroy and wipe out all those people. Well, actually, when you look at it, he had a lot of patience. He was very long-suffering for them, bringing preachers along, people like Enoch, and others that would preach the righteousness of God. Nobody turned. In fact, they got more and more corrupt, more and more wicked. And so the Lord finally said, okay, that's enough. This is done. Now I'm going to bring this flood upon. So it was because of the wickedness of the people that he brought the flood about. The flood itself, we know from, from Scripture, and we believe what the Scripture says here. It's not just a myth. It's not just an allegory. It's not just some story. But it's, it's really something that really happened in, in the past, in the history. So it's a historical event, and we believe that. We believe what the Bible says. And it's interesting because the Bible is very specific in the days and the time frame that all this flood took place. Notice that he talked about the age of Noah at that time, and then how many days when they entered the ark, and how many days was the flood, how many days did it prevail, how many days, and you go on straight straight on through what the scripture says. So we get from that first off, one of the things that happens is we have the windows of heaven opened up. And the idea was 40 days and 40 nights of rain. And this was a torrential rainfall. That was a worldwide rainfall. This was not just a local event, but this was a global event. And you can picture, you know, was it several months ago I mentioned before that uh, we had a, a rainstorm that came through, left about five inches of rain on Detroit. There was flooding all over the place. The roads were flooded, people couldn't drive. That was just in less than a 24-hour period of a heavy rainfall. What we're talking about, this is almost like if you ever get a picture, there's a dam that's damming up some, some river, and you got a lake behind, a reservoir behind it, and they open up the gates, and they let that water flush out, and when that water comes flowing out, that's opening the floodgates, if you will, of that dam. Well, that's kind of the idea that we have here of opening the floodgates of heaven and letting this torrential rain fall upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. But that wasn't all because if you just, it just 40 days and 40 nights of torrential rain, I believe that the rain continued on after that, but it wasn't as strong as those first 40 days and 40 nights. But if you just take that and you figure as much water as could have fallen in a 40 day period, even though it was constant 24 hours, 24 hours a day for the 40 days, 
it probably would have only maybe given us just a several inches of water that covered the earth. So there had to be another mechanism that was going on that, that actually increased the water so that, as the scripture says, the waters went over the tops of the mountains that were at that time. And we believe that probably, or I believe that probably the earth looked different than what it does today. And we'll talk about that probably not, we won't get into this week, but next week. So what happens is you get the water that goes, it says what, 15 cubics above the mountains. So all the mountains, and it says under all the heavens, were covered with 15 cubits of water. So we have this, this global event, 40 days, 40 nights. We have the fountains of the great deep broke up, basically kind of a surging mass of water, if you will, a sea or subterranean waters. We talked a little bit about, and we'll look a little bit more later, what this, potentially what the subterranean waters were. Subterranean, of course, means it below the earth, right? So you have the oceans, and then you have these, this water, if you will. We know right now, if you go, where do we get our water in, in for this church here? Where do most of us get our water that live in this area? We get them from wells. It's from an aquifer, right? So we're pumping water out of the ground. So beneath us, there is groundwater, and then we're pumping that water up. Well, that's the subterranean waters, but there's a mass of subterranean waters. We'll talk about that later. There's also the tectonic activity. We'll get a little bit into the geology of, of this and what potentially could happen. Right now, I'm just really sticking to what the scripture says because there's a lot of speculation. Obviously, nobody was there except for Noah and, and those folks that were back then. So we, looking back now, look at what the geology shows us, what the earth shows us, and, and the mechanisms that we see and we, we learn about, and we try to apply them to what may have happened. And what these. And so we'll take a little look later. But basically, what we know is that the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Then we have the duration of the flood. Looking at all the, all the time frames that the scripture gives us there, what we have is we have kind of a three-stage event, if you will, during this flood. The first stage there, the flood waters, it talks about several times, four times in a couple of sentences, use the words prevailed. The waters prevailed above this. The waters prevailed for this many days. So the, you have the rain falling, you have this Subterranean water that's coming up, you got the flood. During 150 days, the water is increasing till it goes over all the high mountains and it stays and it gets up to that point. And then you get the second stage where the flood waters are starting to abate. That first stage, it says right in the scripture, the waters prevailed for 150 days. So we know it's very, very accurate what the time frame is. Then we have stage two, the flood waters abated for 121 days. That's taking those waters after the 150 days and looking at the scripture. We broke it down. I put together a table last time. I didn't put it up here, up here now, but we do have a table that breaks all this down based on what the scripture says. It comes out to be about 121 days. And then we talked a little bit about where the ark rested. A lot of us, a lot of people think that the ark rested on Mount Ararat, but the scripture actually says it rested in the mountains of Ararat. We talked about where that area is. Basically, it's the mountain range of Armenia, kind of right there, right on the border of Turkey and Iran and Armenia to the north. So kind of in that area. But there's a whole big mountain range there where the ark actually rested. We looked at some of the evidence of that. And, uh, but what we have then is uh, the, the ark came to rest in those mountains. Could have been Mount Ararat. It's probably a lot different uh, than what it looked like than what it looks like today. Stage three, the flood water dried off the face of the earth for another hundred days. So then you get a total kind of a flood event, if you will, of about 371 days is, is basically what you come up with. So then we get into the last thing that we talked about was the extent of the flood. And one of the things that's important to remember about this, there are a lot of, lot of commentators out there, a lot of people that are Christian people, evangelical people that believe this was a local flood event. The problem is that when you look at the scripture and what it talks about and the verbiage it uses, it talks about all the high mountains being covered under heaven, everything, every man and animal that had the breath of life. It uses very specific terms that would indicate that this is more of a global event. Now, one of the things we mentioned before is that if you look at my little picture here that I drew, so, you know, I just kind of drew this thing here. So it's possible that we had one land mass back then. And during this global breaking up of the fountains of the great deep, we'll get into a little bit of the uh, kind of the geology in the next couple of weeks. But anyways, possibly just one land, land mass. It's speculation at this point, right? 
Okay, so the extent of the flood, the scripture is clear. The flood was global in extent, covering the mountains with 22 feet of water. Every human and land-dwelling animal and the birds were destroyed. So either all those animals, all those people, everybody lived in a very small area of Mesopotamia, right? And then the waters came in there and kind of covered that one area, and everything died, and nobody lived outside that area. And if you remember... Looking at kind of just even the, even the human growth or the, the birth rate today, using a, just a, a very conservative birth rate of today, if we went back in time from the time of Adam to the time of the flood, which is about fifteen to 1,600 years, you could have over a million people. But you could also have as much as one billion people that were alive at that time during that flood. That's a lot of people. So to live in one little small area of Mesopotamia and not move out, it, you know, again... We don't really know. We're just trying to use numbers that are today going back and putting those into time. But it's very possible that there were at least several million of people on the earth at that time during those 1,500 years. All right. So that's kind of where we left off last time. So then we went into... I can get this thing to work. There we go. All right. So we had uh, God provided directions for the ark. We looked at the first thing. We finished up with number three last week. And then we have uh, moving to number four, the purpose of the ark. Well, the purpose of the ark is actually pretty straightforward. You know, really one of the big things was, wow, it's kind of hard to read. Oh, back there it is. Um, so what we have is the purpose of the ark. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy son's wife with thee. That's Genesis 6.18. So first off, one of the things is, is that he's preserving his, if you will, he's preserving his covenant that he made all the way back with Adam and Eve. Coming back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and I will put enmity between thee and, thy, and the woman, talking about the serpent, right? Um, talking about the serpent and the woman who is Eve, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. We're not talking about a bunch of people, but we're talking about one really specific. This is really the first presentation of the gospel, if you will, that the plan of salvation would consist of we're all sinners, and because we're sinners, we're on our way to hell, to devil's hell. So God sent his son, his only begotten son, right? That whosoever puts their faith in them should not perish but have everlasting life. So this is the first presentation, if you will, of the gospel. That seed you're talking about there is a prophecy really that our Lord Jesus of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's that got to be that preservation. If he wiped out everything, then you, then that covenant would also have been destroyed. So he's preserving that covenant, if you will. It's also confirming a new covenant with Noah, chapter nine, verses eight through thirteen. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, "And I, I behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you." of the fowl and of cattle and of the every beast of the earth with you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. I, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither shall there be any more, uh, uh, be, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For perpetual generations, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. So what we have is basically the Lord saying he's established this, co this covenant back with Adam and Eve. He's preserving the seed so that he's preserving that covenant. But then he's also making, he's foreshadowing, if you will, the covenant that he is going to make with Noah and his seed going forward. In that one, he's going to preserve life, preserve a seed of mankind, preserve a seed for the animals. And then also he's not going to destroy the earth anymore or destroy all mankind with a flood. And so that was this new covenant that he was making with him. So the other purpose, the other thing that's stated directly in there is chapter 6, verse 19 and 21. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, and you can read them all. So basically, uh, Genesis chapter 7, verse 2 through 3 says the same thing. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens. The male and his female of the beasts that are uh, not clean by two, the male and the female of the fowls also, 
And uh, you can read the rest of that. And then also down in Hebrews chapter 11, 7, By faith, Noah, being warned of God, things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So what we have when you kind of summarize that then, the purpose of the ark really is to the salvation of the house in Noah, Hebrews eleven seven, 7, and to preserve his covenant from those two, and then also to preserve the seed of the animals, the land animals and the birds. All right. So next thing that we have, I'm going to go back there. Just our, So the last one is we have the obedience of Noah. That's in chapter 6, verse 22, the obedience of Noah. So the obedience of Noah, Genesis chapter 6, 8, and 9. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Genesis 6, 22. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And in Genesis 7, 5 through 9. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of every clean beast, and the beasts that are not clean, of the fowls, and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah, into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. Genesis eight fifteen through 17, And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons, and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of the fowl and of the cattle, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. Second Peter 2.5, And spare not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So what we see here is we start seeing is the obedience of, of Noah, and get this thing. First thing that we see is there is his righteousness, Noah's righteousness. Although the scripture doesn't really specify, doesn't give us a lot of detail about the, um, the righteousness of Noah, what that included or what that may have entailed, um, it does indicate that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and that he walked with God. Unlike the other people, those that were destroyed in the flood, they were not walking with the Lord. So who else, when we take a, start taking a look at this idea of walking with the Lord, as Noah walked with the Lord, a couple people that come into mind. First off is Enoch. Enoch. So we have Enoch in Genesis chapter 5, 24, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And if we go down and look at a couple other scriptures there, we get a kind of an idea of what this, what this really entails, of walking with God. And that's what we kind of want to take a look at a little bit here. So Hebrews 11, 5b through 6a says, Before his translation, that's Enoch, he had this testimony. Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. So that was his testimony, that he did things. He did things that pleased God. Well, part of that, pleasing God, if you just continue right into verse 6, that follows after verse 5, it says that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. So Noah walked by faith. He walked with the Lord. He walked by faith. He trusted the Lord. He trusted the Lord what he said. He trusted the Lord of, of things that, that the Lord had spoken to him, whether it be in worship or whether it be in prayer or whether it be in service. Everything that, no, that Enoch did at that time, he was walking by faith, trusting the Lord. Jude one fourteen. another aspect of that. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints, to execute judgment upon all and to con, uh, convince all that are ungodly among them, all the ungodly deeds which, were, have, which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So here we get the idea. So not only was he walking by faith in all that he did, but in that walking by faith, he was also a preaching. He was preaching the word. Basically trying to get people to turn back from the Lord. If you remember, the people were, were waiting... You know, we're getting more wicked, more corrupt, and more wicked as they, as they went on. So here Enoch was out there preaching the Lord. And we have another person, David. This is uh, the Lord speaking to Solomon, 1 Kings 9, 4 through A. And if thou wilt walk before me, so he's talking to Solomon here. He says, Solomon, if you're going to walk before me, walk before me like your, like your father David did. 
So we have Enoch as an example of somebody who's walking with the Lord, and we also have David as an example of walking with the Lord. It says, uh, if you will walk before me as David, my, thy father, walked in integrity, that word integrity basically means completeness, if you will, or simplicity, it's kind of an interesting word, and also means sincerity of heart, if you will. So you have this idea of walking in integrity of heart and an uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded of thee. So that integrity has to do with honesty. And when we're talking about simplicity and, and sincerity, about a purity or a holiness, if you will. So we walked with the integrity and also with uprightness. And did all, all that the Lord had commanded him. Second Chronicles, again looking at, he's talking to Jehoshaphat here. And Jehoshaphat was walking with the Lord similar, to, very similar as David, his father, had walked. Right? So you get the same type of thing. You get an idea of what it means to walk with the Lord. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David and sought not unto Balaam, but sought to the Lord God of his fathers and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. So if you remember at that time, of course, you know, the ten tribes of Israel, they, they were not walking with the Lord. In fact, they were very idolatrous. And so here you have Jehoshaphat. He, he was in, you know, he was part of the two southern tribes, the tribes that were really the tribes of Judah and and, uh, and Benjamin, and uh, so they were, they were walking, they, he was walking with the Lord. He wasn't following after those things that Israel, the northern tribes were doing, those northern kings were doing. Second Kings 22, 2, and he, jo, uh, Josiah, did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked on all the ways of his David, his father, again, and turned not to the side to the right hand or to the left. I think about that idea of turning to the right hand or to the left. I like to ride mountain bikes. And one of the things you want to do when you're riding a mountain bike, they have these things called skinnies. Basically what a skinny is, is you, maybe a tree has fallen down or whatever, and they just kind of shave off the top of that tree. And you come up to it on your mountain bike, you kind of hop up on this tree, and then you ride along it, and then you drop off the other side. It's fun, scary, but it's fun. I've fallen a couple of times. Anyways, the reason why I fell, what you want to do is when you're going on that skinny, you don't want to look over here, and you don't want to look over there, right? Because typically what happens when you're riding your bike, wherever you're looking, that's the way your bike is going to go. Typical, same thing in a car. So if you're looking over here, you're going to tend to go that way. Well, what you want to do is you want to look down the path, not right down here, but you want to look at your end. You want to look at your goal. You want to look at the ending. You want to look at where you want to be when you're done with that skinny. When you look down there at the end, where you want to be instead of the right hand or the left, you're going to make it across that skinny, and you're going to drop off, and you'll be fine. But when you look to the left or right, you can fall out. The other thing is when you're going down on a mountain bike, you're going down a hill, and you're whipping around some corners and through the trees and all that kind of stuff, you don't want to look when you're going around a corner. You don't want to look over a berm, right, because it'll tend to take you right over that berm. You don't want to look down here. Where you want to look is you want to look at your exit point. You want to look at the point of where you want to be coming out of that corner, right? So you're coming down, and so where I'm looking, I'm looking over here, just over here. I'm not looking at the tree. If I look at the tree, I'm going to hit the tree. I'm not looking at the rock. If I look at the rock, I'm going to hit the rock. We call that window shopping in, uh, in uh, mountain biking because basically what you're doing is you're looking at something. It's like, oh, that looks nice. I'm going to go over here, and boom, you run into the rock. So, so what you want to do is you want to look at where you want to be, not to the left, and not to the right. The same type of thing that Josiah did. He kept his eyes focused on the Lord. You know, get a lot of shiny things out there, right? A lot of things out in the world, and that's what he was doing. Israel was doing these things up here. Josiah wasn't put, taking his eyes off what the Lord wanted. He wasn't looking at what northern tribes were doing, what Israel was doing. He was focused on what the Lord wanted him to do. And so he didn't look to the left or right. So those are kind of our examples. When we talk about where we're at in our lives, I mean, really, the first thing is that, have you put your faith and trust in Christ Jesus, your Lord and Savior? That's really the first step, right? Because all our righteousness are as filthy rags. That's what the scripture said. There's not one person that's righteous in and of themselves. There's nothing we can do to earn heaven. There's nothing we can do to gain God's acceptance or anything like that, but only through Jesus Christ. Once Christ saves us, then we're clothed with his righteousness, God sees us through the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of my favorite verses, my life verse, 
this whole section of Scripture, if you will, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, basically. But 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he made him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin. That who knew no sin, of course, is our, talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. He did, he was sinless, right? So he could be that perfect sacrifice for us. Who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Our righteousness comes through our Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship with him. That's kind of the first step. Then you, can, you kind of go on down into Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him, with Christ, by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should, what? Walk in newness of life. Not as the Gentiles walked, Right? We don't want to walk in the way that we used to walk before the Lord saved us, but we're now a, we have a, we have a, we're a new creature. We're a new creation, if you will, right? And so we want to walk in that newness of life. We want to put all those other things aside. Well, what does that kind of mean when we're talking about, because remember now, what we're looking at, we're going back to the whole idea that Noah, one of the reasons that Noah was found um, pleasing the Lord is because he walked with him. Enoch walked with him. David walked with him. Jehoshaphat walked with the Lord. So we want to also walk in newness of life. We want to walk with the Lord. Well, let's take, there's a few verses there that I have, and you can look at a whole bunch more, but we just have some of these up here. Romans 13, 13. Let us walk honestly. It's one of the first things. Walk honestly. What does that mean? Walk sincerely. Walk uprightly. Walk justly. And walk with integrity. Kind of has that whole idea of walking honestly, with a pure heart, with integrity. Ephesians 4, 1 and then 17b, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation. That word vocation means an invitation, a divine invitation, a divine calling. We have a calling from the Lord. He's, give, he's, he's called us and he's given us gifts. And we ought to be walking in accordance with that things that he's called us to do. Um, invitation wherewith you are called, not as the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Ephesians 5, 8, For ye were sometimes in darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In other words, children of light, those, those that, that have come to know Christ, we've been enlightened, right? We used to be in darkness, but the Lord has enlightened us to understand really the sinfulness of sin, if you will, how evil sin is. And because we've been enlightened on that, we ought not to be involved in any kind of sin because we know that's what our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, right? That's who we were before he, was, before he saved us, right? And so we want to we wanna walk as children of light, uh, those enlightened to the evil of sin, thus walk in faith, truth, and holiness. Uh, Colossians 1.10, that you might walk worthy, having qualities suited to. That's what the idea of walking worthy, having qualities suited suited to, um, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. There's that word that we looked at a little before, pleasing. Uh, no, no uh, Enoch was pleasing to the Lord. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Colossians 2, 6, If you therefore receive Christ, uh, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Colossians 4, 5, Walk in wisdom toward them that are out, out without, redeeming the time. 1 John 2, 6, he that saith he abideth in him, that's Jesus, ought him also to walk even as he, that's our Lord Jesus, walked. So there's just a few verses that talk about our walk as a believer. And I, I can stand up here and say I, I don't always walk this way. You know, I still have that, those sinful desires sometimes, or that flesh, the, the world is out here, we have that enemy, the world, our own flesh, and also that adversary. That adversary that's always the accuser of the brother, trying to accuse us of things that the Lord has already forgiven us of. It's one of the hardest things that I've had to overcome sometimes. Sometimes that comes back in my mind. Yeah, Zelmer, look what you did. The Lord's already forgiven me. All right. So uh, that was looking at his righteousness. So um, doesn't uh, give specifics, but we also ought to walk in newness of life. Not only that, but then also he followed God's instructions, right? He followed God's instructions to the saving of his life. He didn't cut corners, or we might say, do it my way. He wasn't the author of that song, I did it my way. No, he didn't do it. He did it the Lord's way, right? He didn't cut corners. What the Lord told him to do, that's what I'm going to do. 
right? So he also, so how did he do that? Well, he entered the ark when instructed by God, uh, 7 4. You know, it's interesting because if you look back, God told Noah and his family, I want you to enter the ark now. And then they go in there. It was seven days before he started the rain. So here's Noah, and we talked about this last time, right? Noah and his family are sitting in this ark. They, they probably have no idea, not probably, they pro- well, yeah, probably had no idea what, really, what was really going to happen. You know, what's this flood? What's rain, right? Whether rain had occurred th- at that time or not, it's, that's hard to say. I can go either way, um, but there's a possibility it didn't. But regardless, Noah probably didn't have an idea. So can you imagine, I want you to go into this thing, this ark, and I want you to sit and I want you to wait. Wait for me. Wait for my timing. And so they waited in there for seven days. Finally, the rain started. Okay, so now you got this rain. Wow, this is something that's new. This rain is really, this is coming down really hard. But it's probably seven, several days before that ark probably actually lifted off the earth and started to float. And then can you imagine how long? 300 days they were in that ark. I don't know about you. That's a long time. I'd sit in there, you would be sitting in there and, and wondering what's going to happen. You know, how long is this going to be? Is this going to be a week? A week passes. Is this going to be a month? Two months pass. Five months pass. Six months pass. A whole year passes. And he's still in this ark waiting for the Lord to do what? To exit at the instruction of the Lord. Every step along the way, Noah followed. He, didn't, he, did, he followed God's instructions. We're going to stop there, and we'll pick that up next week as we look at, back at that uh, follow God's instruction. Let's close, close in a word of prayer. Our Father, we want to thank you for this time you've given us this morning to look into your word and just look at this portion of scripture in Genesis. Father, we just, uh, just pray for the service to come up. Would you strengthen our pastor's voice, Lord? Would you fill him with your spirit? Help us to come with a mind and a heart ready to receive what you have for us this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.